Cheryl, I uh, wanted to bring you back onto the show to have another important conversation about what we're looking towards uh, in terms of hospital capacity, uh, COVID-19 and the flu, uh, which we're hearing is going to be a concern as well moving into the colder season. First of all, let's talk about where we are in terms of hospital capacity right now. Um, couldn't be better timing to uh, be bringing this subject up, James. Um, currently, we have 19 patients with COVID in hospital. Uh, last week, near the end of the week, we had 30 patients. We had three units across the two sites that were an outbreak, which meant uh, obviously limiting admissions. Um, we had you no know, visiting. Um, so we had two units in Huntsville that were on outbreak and one in Bracebridge. Mm -hmm. uh, today, our capacity, uh, we've come out of um, uh, outbreak in two of the units. Uh, but our capacity is still very high, James. We're sitting at 136% occupancy in Huntsville, 129% um, in Bracebridge. So it really um, is putting a strain um, in terms of getting patients up into inpatient beds from the emergency department. Those are definitely eyebrow raising numbers. Um, mm. Considering we have two sites that are both way over capacity, that's I mean, I would say that's comparable with the bigger cities in terms of how their capacity is and their one hospital is over. Um, but let's talk about what we're looking at moving forward because I, I've heard, and I'm sure you have too, that uh, there's a concern about the flu season and the severity of the flu season coming up um, with indicators. We look across the ocean at uh, other uh, continents to see how they've been dealing with it. And I know that's been a bit of a concern, but also, um, we are not really fully out of the COVID-19 pandemic either, right? So tell me what you are looking towards, maybe what you're most concerned about right now in terms of, of these items and other capacity issues we might be moving into into the winter season. Um, well, you mentioned obviously the flu season and, and that's often um, sometimes difficult to predict, but you, as you mentioned, our uh, neighbors across the ocean are a pretty good prediction of what we might see for the flu season. Um, there has already been identified cases uh, throughout Simcoe Muskoka through the health unit of, of influenza. And you're right, um, COVID is still on the increase. Um, as of Friday, our medical officer of health declared Simcoe Muskoka uh, moving from a moderate to a high risk for COVID. So, and you know, that just tells us that uh, we're not out of this yet. Of course, our seasonal um, flu, as well as for our pediatric patients, it's a, a season for respiratory illnesses, for our children and for our elderly, not just flu, um, but we know the winter months are very hard on our vulnerable populations related to respiratory illness. So what does that mean for you as the, uh, you know, as the CEO of MAC and, and looking towards the, you already have high capacity. What are your concerns right now? Our, our concerns are keeping um, the flow and the access to our communities across the Muskoka district. And, and um, I have to say, and keeping our staff healthy as well. Um, and they've been stepping up um, day in and day out to ensure that we keep all services open. Uh, we do everything possible um, in terms of our staffing models so that we don't have to do any reduction. We're fortunate um, in the sense that we do have two sites. So we do have some opportunity sometimes to shift um, services and, and still maintain access across the district. Um, my concern for the winter months is keeping our staff healthy so they can continue to do that for us. And, and you know, a plug for people to get their vaccines, um, their flu shots, their boosters for COVID, you know, the more that they can keep themselves healthy and out of our hospital and emergency department, it's, it's better for everybody. Um, and, you know, that, that would be my plea to folks. Cheryl, I, I want to go back to the comment you made, and I was going to ask about this, of, of Dr. Gardner's move of the COVID situation from moderate to high. Now, when we spoke to Dr. Gardner earlier this week, he did say that was more of a, a health unit kind of thing to just keep track of the cases in the area, and it wasn't a big concern yet, yet uh, in very important terms uh, to mm -hmm. to look at uh, on a public level. But when you when you see that happening, um, what do you think of that? And also, what does that mean for the hospital sites as well when that uh, you know when that rating moves to high? 
Well, I think it's, um, you know, it's great to have that information because we've learned through the pandemic that trying to move on a dime is is very difficult. So that state of readiness, knowing that wastewaters are starting to go up, we're watching, you know, even south of us and more urban areas where we're seeing ICU utilization go up and really just, you know, trying to plan a little bit ahead of, of the curve to say, um, you know, we may, it may come our way even even harder and, and, you know, just trying to prepare our staff, keep, keep the patient flow going continuously so that we um, don't get overburdened. And if, if the pandemic raises its head again, where we might be able to, to manage a bit differently. How is staff morale right now? I mean, there's been obviously a, a I don't want to call this a break, but there's, there's been a bit of um, an easier time, I guess, versus what we had over the past two years of the pandemic um, capacities and, and burning out staff. But has there been, I guess, um, you know, a, a, a bit of relief among staff to have, you know, not as many COVID cases mm -hmm. coming through the hospital right now? I, I wouldn't say that it's been easier. I would say that it's been different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they maybe not having as much isolation in your day-to-day -day work, but we've had significant staffing gaps. And so they're still working short. We are still having overcapacity. So, and they're tired. I mean, we've, we've tried to do um, as much as we can over the summertime to get people some vacation relief. Um, however, you know, we're sitting right now with more than a hundred job opportunities um, posted to fill. So we're, they're working short every day. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's tough. It's, it's a different type of, of burden than what they were feeling necessarily with being, you know, having, you know, 30 COVID patients. But remember, we just had 30 COVID patients last week. So they no sooner get a little bit of a, a waning away from the isolation needs, and then they're still working short, and then they get, you know, the COVID um, impact again. So it's, it's almost a roller coaster for them. And I can't say enough. Um, to the healthcare workers at Mac, um, they just step up every day, and even when we're at the eleventh hour, worried about what how we're going to provide service, um, they figure it out. So, so Cheryl, it's, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, no, no. If if it sounds to me like there is still a high potential of burnout here for staff because of the capacity, because of the low staffing, um, you know, holes in the system and things like that. What what is the, the biggest danger that comes with staff burnout, would you say? Well, you know, it's the morale. You're in the caring business, right? And it's um, when you get burnt out and you're coming, showing up to work and you want to give it all you, you can, but you can't. Um, it's not very rewarding when you leave at the end of the day. We already know um, when I talk to staff that they're not always... Um, able to do what they want to do and that's discouraging but when you start to get burnt out um, that doesn't help and and quite honestly for our mental health you know bur burnout um, contributes to you know lots of other mental health illnesses and 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 worries in my opinion so we we are trying to you know put in supports be there give them the you know the cheer cheerleading rah-rah and, and try to support them where we can um, we've done a lot an awful lot to to try to recognize them. And sometimes it's just that, you know, acknowledgement. And we saw that early in the pandemic, how motivating that was for frontline workers to just get that pat on the shoulder. And and, and, I, and I do want to thank our pa patients and families for their patience, um, their continued patience, because I know it's tough to come into, into um, get service and have to wait. Um, but the more that they can show their gratitude to our frontline workers can go an awful long way for burnout. Cheryl, I want to say thank you to you, uh, first of all, because since you started uh, in this role, your, your uh, candid look at, at how things are running in the hospital has been very refreshing. And honestly, it gives us a better perspective of what is happening. And I think everyone appreciates that. So thank you uh, very much for being so open and honest about how things are running. It, it gives us in Muskoka and wider area a real uh, better look and an idea of how things are going and, and maybe, you know, motivate some people to, to do what they can to help out. Well, I certainly appreciate it. And anytime, um, James, happy to, to be part of your show.
Thank you very much, Cheryl. And, and again, should say thank you to your staff as well. Their, their work is beyond uh, amazing and, and the appreciation cannot be expressed, I think, in just one uh, sentence from me. So, um, but I think we will leave it there and I appreciate you again taking some time today, Cheryl. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, take care. 